Uh, it's an honor to be here, at least digitally, uh, and I'm grateful for the invitation. I'd like to talk with you about this proposal that every time we use a concept or understand the meaning of a word, we're creating that meaning ad hoc. The idea motivating this proposal is that we as cognitive scientists have created some of our own hardest problems. And these problems can't be solved, but they don't need to be. Uh, instead, they can be dissolved and reframed in light of a couple of assumptions that, that I'll ar argue for now. The first assumption is that scientific constructs, uh, the, the constructs we all think about and write about all the time, constructs like concepts and lexical entries, uh, et cetera, these are made up. These are human inventions created by scholars for other scholars, uh, in some cases created for, for colloquial use. And <clears throat> since we made them up, we can therefore use them or change them or discard them as we see fit. And this suggestion is not meant to devalue constructs like concepts and lexical entries, but rather to free us from the allegiance that we might feel toward them if we thought that they were natural kinds, right? Uh, instead, these are constructs, these, these are tools that our community has fashioned, and we can refashion them as needed to help us to understand the things we're trying to understand, things like language and brains and minds. The second assumption is that our brains and minds are continually shaped by the contexts in which we're doing our thinking. Now, the, the dynamism of our minds is hard to intuit, just as uh, the dynamism of the natural world more broadly is hard to intuit. Things feel much more static, much more stable than they are. We feel, for example, that the ground we're standing on or sitting on now is, is pretty stable. It's hard to wrap our heads around the fact that actually the earth beneath us is spinning around and hurtling through space. But the fact that that dynamism is hard to intuit doesn't mean that it's not there. So <clears throat> with these two... Uh, with these two assumptions in mind, my slides will freeze, and then it'll be a, a, a much quicker talk than I had planned. Let's see. There we go. Uh, with these two assum assumptions as a backdrop, let's turn to one of the big questions that animates the cognitive sciences. What's in our minds? What are they made of? Well, for a long time, this question could only be addressed through metaphor. Plato, for example, worked through a bunch of metaphors, a series of them, at, at one point positing that maybe the mind was like a birdcage. And each piece of knowledge uh, in, in our minds was a bird. Now, when we're not using uh, that, that knowledge, each piece of knowledge, it's, it's free to flap about the cage of our memories. When we need to use it, we just need to catch or retrieve the right bird. So there's a hidden assumption here, and that is that knowledge is itemized, that knowledge is prepackaged into units that exist in our memories, fully formed, like, like animals, uh, waiting for us to retrieve them. Well, uh, it was uh, it was clear uh, back in Plato's time, as it is now, that there are not actually birds in our heads, but we now posit that our minds are populated by even more elusive creatures, uh, creatures that we call things like uh, concepts uh, and categories and word meanings. And uh, I guess every time I click the mouse, it's going to take several clicks. This will this will uh, add uh, some chance to the presentation. Uh, we'll we'll see whether that's a positive or a negative. <clears throat> so, uh, ordinarily, uh, we we often talk about concepts and categories as, and word meanings as separate constructs. But but when we look at them, they're actually very hard to separate. Uh, according to standard definitions, concepts are bodies of knowledge that allow us to categorize things. Categories are the extensions of those concepts. Words have meanings by activating concepts or by labeling categories. Uh, so for, although for some purposes, we may want to separate out these, these constructs, for, for many purposes, uh, they're very hard to separate. And so I'm going to, to lump them all together. Uh, referring to them as C, C, and M's, concepts, categories, and, and, and meanings. Uh, and I want to suggest that our current theories of C, C, and M's preserve one key element of Plato's aviary model of the mind uh, to, to the detriment of the cognitive sciences. And what it preserves is this unshakable intuition that C, C, and M's exist in some sense, fully formed, even when we're not using them waiting for us to access them, like looking up entries in a mental encyclopedia or a mental dictionary. Uh, an alternative is that all CCNMs are created ad hoc. 
So according to the, this ad hoc cognition proposal that Gary Lupien and I made a few years ago, a concept, category, or word meaning is a dynamic pattern of information that's made active transiently as needed in response to internally generated or external cues. So on this model, the meaning of cat is the pattern of neurocognitive activity that results from processing this cue, the, the word form cat, in a given physical, social, linguistic, mnemonic, and physiological context. This pattern of activity will never be the same twice, and it will vary on uh, at least three overlapping time scales from one millisecond to the next, according to what we've, we've called the activation dynamics of the brain and mind, from one instantiation to the next, according to um, various aspects of the local context, and from one individual to the next and one group to the next, according to people's experiential history, longer term experiential history, uh, what I've called experiential relativity. So let's contrast a process of ad hoc meaning construction with what I take to be a generic standard view of how words have meanings. Uh, words, forms are paired with their stored meanings, right? We, we talk often about form meaning pairing or form meaning mapping. And so, so here's, here's how the, the flow goes. Uh, uh, according to standard views, you have a word, right? Uh, 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 or it could be a picture or a gesture or something that, that stands in place of the word. And when we process that, that uh, external symbol, it prompts us to form an internal representation of the form of that symbol, right? We see the word C-A, uh, excuse me, the, the letter C-A-T, and we recognize uh, that to be an instance of the word form cat, right? And we internally represent the word form cat. That internal representation of the symbol's form, of the word's form, uh, uh, cues us to activate the concept that corresponds to that, that word's form. So to activate the, the, the concept of cat. And that's real where, where the real the real meat of this, this model is, right? That's where that's where the good stuff is. Uh, words cause us to activate stored concepts that are that 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 correspond to those word forms. And in addition, there may be some uh, further information that is associated with with this concept that gets activated, but that's downstream. It's not con constitutive of the concept and it's it's not necessary. So uh, that's that's what I take to be the standard model. you can you can look to Jack and Doff, you can look to to uh, uh, cognitive linguists on the, on the other hand. Uh, uh, many, uh, many different versions of, of this model. According to the ad hoc cognition model, instead of words having meaning, words in context, or really word forms in context, are cues to construct a meaning in, in this instance. So we start out with this box. We, we, we've got the word form in context. We're specifying that, 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 that all we have here is a word form. Uh, and it could be a, a picture or a gesture as well. Uh, again, the model share that, that the next stage is that we map this, this external representation of a word's form onto some internal representation of that word's form. Uh, but that is our retrieval cue. That internal representation of the word's form spreads to other internal representations of, of word's forms and to other bits of information. Uh, and uh, the activation of information that is cued by this in internal representation of a word's form uh, in this particular context, that is the concept or the word meaning for for this instance, right? There's 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 no there's no permanently existing box uh, that has to get activated. Uh, so word forms are not paired with meanings; they are cues to activate a network of knowledge, which we can call the meaning for a given instance. When we perceive a word form, we first categorize it uh, as an instance of a particular form, and then that is a cue to activate contextually relevant information. That's the whole story. Word forms are, are, are cues in context. Uh, they cue patterns of neurocognitive activity, neural slash cognitive activity, that constitute our thoughts. And these patterns will necessarily differ from one usage to the next. Now, the illusion that word forms simply map onto a concept is encouraged by lots of factors, one of which is that there are constraints on the contexts in which a given word form tends to occur, right? To the extent that the context 
in which a word form occurs is similar across time, the network of information that gets activated will also be similar. And this yields some true stability in meaning across usages. But importantly, that stability is emergent. It's emergent from this process of, of, of uh, cues in context activating information. Uh, it's not built in and it's not guaranteed. And that 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 uh, stable answer that we're expecting could disappear when the same word form is used in a new context. So one entailment of this story of this process of ad hoc meaning construction is that in principle, any word form can cue any network of information in memory given the right context. That is to say, in principle, if we accept that the meaning of a word is the pattern of neurocognitive activity that it cues, then any word can mean anything. Uh, it's just that some meanings are much more likely than others. This may sound crazy, but I actually think it's true and that it's crucial for us to understand if we want to advance theories of mind and language. So uh, not everybody agrees uh, with, with this proposal, uh, especially not at first. Uh, a wise friend once pointed out to me that if we're honest as, as academics, uh, there are really only three kinds of answers that, that we, we give to each other as colleagues uh, when, when we're confronted with, with ideas like this. Uh, the first one is, hey, that's crazy, and that can't possibly be true. Uh, and the second is, hmm, yeah, okay, so what you're saying is true, but it's trivial, right? Uh, we all know that. And the third is, that's true, and it's really important. And in fact, I said the same thing in my dissertation. Uh, and the thing about uh, talking about ad hoc cognition is that uh, we often get all three of these responses, uh, sometimes from the same person, right? Uh, one after the other. Uh, so let me try to artic articulate this view a little more, and you can decide uh, which of these answers you prefer. So the plan is uh, uh, first to talk about, uh, let, let's locate this idea with respect to some other proposals throughout the history of, of, of thinking about thinking. Uh, so one, how is this different from what so-and-so said? Uh, the second is, well, okay, why is it so hard to intuit that all of our thinking is ad hoc? And three, how might uh, an AHC ad hoc cognition framework change the way we think about uh, thinking and language use? So we'll see what we have time for. Uh, please feel free to uh, to jump in anytime if you have a question. Uh, this, this is our time to use as we wish uh, on an ad hoc basis. Uh, so how is this proposal different from what's what's been said in the past? Well, actually, the the idea that the stability of the natural world is an illusion dates back thousands of years, right? This is presumably what Heraclitus meant when he said something like, uh, it's not possible to step into the same river tri twice, right? Even the same thing uh, is different as a function of uh, all various aspects of context, including just the passage of, of uh, seconds or minutes. Um, uh, uh, is it the same river? Well, that depends on the context because rivers are always changing you may be able to experience, quote, the same river for some purposes at some levels of description, but for other, other purposes, it's definitely not the same in ways that could really matter. Maybe, maybe the same river at time one was pure, but at time two, it has been poisoned a few seconds later, right? So is it the same? Uh, functionally, no. Uh, you're not going to respond to it the same. You're not going to uh, feel about it the same. Uh, uh, the idea that the, the stability of, of uh, uh, CCNMs is an illusion is at least a century old within uh, Western philosophy and, and psychology. Uh, William James tells us that no idea is ever the same twice, that, that a permanently existing idea, which makes its appearance before the footlights of consciousness uh, at periodic intervals, is, he says, as mythological as the Jack of Spades. Uh, so uh, I, I often feel like what 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 our job as, as contemporary cognitive scientists is, is just to understand everything that James wrote in the, the early 1900s. Uh, and and the, the, the person who I think of as the, the father of this, this kind of idea, uh, although I, I don't want to, to uh, tar, tar him with, with the same, same brush, but, but the person who inspired this thinking the most in me uh, was Wittgenstein. Uh, uh, one of one of the persuasive arguments is where he points to the fact that uh, uh, it's very hard to find uh, core features of, in in this case, word meanings. Right in this passage that that, that you you're probably familiar with, 
Uh, consider what we call games, board games, card games, ball games, Olympic games, and so on. What is common to all of them? Don't say there must be something in common, or they wouldn't all be called by the same name, games, but look and see. For if you look, you will not see something that's in common at all. Okay, so uh, more than half a century label, uh, we, 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 are, we are still wrestling with this idea uh, that, that we, we can't trust the fact that things have the same label uh, as, a, as an indication that they are, that those labels refer to the same thing. Uh, so, okay, th this, this idea has a distinguished history. Surely then, everybody already believes in ad hoc CCNMs, right? Uh, and the alternative view that CCNMs uh, are fixed or context independent, surely this is a straw man that nobody believes, right? Uh, does anybody really believe in fixed concepts and, and categories and word meanings or, or in or invariant cores to these CCNMs? Well, the answer is yes, they, they most certainly do. Uh, and uh, there was a beautiful illustration of this. Uh, 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 as Stefan mentioned, uh, Gary and I published a, uh, a chapter on this in a, in a concepts book a few years ago, uh, uh, the, uh, Mark Wallace's Conceptual Mind, uh, Mark Wallace and Lawrence's Conceptual Mind. And uh, our chapter was called uh, all, all Concepts Are Ad Hoc Concepts. Uh, the very next chapter uh, was called by, by, by a, a, a wonderful colleague, Edouard Marquerie, was called by default, all concepts, uh, concepts are accessed in a context independent manner. Uh, so these two chapters have their own section in that book. They're, it's like they're locked in there in, in uh, eternal combat. Uh, so it's, it, it is very much the case that this is a live idea that at least the cores of concepts uh, are, are context invariant and that uh, the, the real stuff of meaning is these context invariant cores. Now, uh, so the, 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 the funny thing is that uh, uh, Maheri is an anti-contextualist, right? He's, he's, he's opposed to the, the very kind of idea that I'm putting forth. But even the researchers that you might associate most with championing contextual variability uh, have also championed a, a model where there is variability around some stable core, right? Or where variability is the exception, not the rule. So I'm thinking uh, in particular, uh, the, the, the name ad hoc cognition is in part an homage to this 1983 paper uh, by Larry Barcelou, where he introduced this idea that, hey, some of our categories appear to be constructed ad hoc, right? Uh, and uh, these are things like things to sell at a garage sale or things to tape camping or ways to escape from the mafia. Uh, these, hopefully, these are not categories that we construct and, and activate all the time or have to use all the time. Uh, but what Barcelou argued in, in the, 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 the thing that, that uh, most readers take away from, from this paper is, hey, we should think about these ad hoc categories. But they are they're expressly contrasted with common categories like furniture and pets and food, which are uh, presented as uh, the, the normal categories that we use most of the time. Right, these are these are memorized and just accessed. You just retrieve their members. Well, there is certainly uh, I would hope that there's a difference in how frequently we might need to use categories from one list versus the other. Hopefully, we think about food more than we think about escaping from the mafia. Uh, but it seems really unlikely that even quote common categories like these are simply memorized and retrieved from. Right, uh, Wittgenstein explained how it's impossible to enumerate all the members of a category or to draw a boundary around that category, right? We, we, we don't actually use categories the, the way we think we do. So uh, an example here, uh, if we just look at these, uh, the, these categories, for example, the extension of the category furniture, right, depends critically on what it is that you're furnishing, furnishing right? If you're furnishing a kitchen, then even prototypical pieces of, of furniture, like a couch or a bed, have no place in your mental category that, that, that you're applying now. If you're furnishing a campsite, right, a fallen tree may become furniture. So pets, sure, cats and dogs might be the most common, but people will keep anything as pets, right, from, from llamas to rocks. Uh, what counts as food uh, varies hugely between, in, in, between individuals and groups, right, according to 
uh, my my uh, uh, toddler daughter, uh, the category of food is just about anything that you can fit inside your mouth. Um, uh, so these are uh, these are certainly categories that we ordinarily construct ad hoc, even even if uh, they they appear common and they they appear to us stable over time. So. Uh, what about people who have been expressly interested in the idea of ad hoc concepts? So Alad and Textor uh, have a, uh, a, a paper that's well worth reading uh, that, again, argues some concepts are ad hoc. At least it, it starts out that way. They mention uh, that there are, there are real concepts, uh, like uh, Eric Clapton is a great guitarist. This uh, great guitarist is, is, is a, a, a standard concept, whereas saying Eric Clapton is God would be using an ad hoc concept, right? And and the the authors suggest that these ad hoc concepts uh, are not the majority of our concepts. They play a complementary role to to our real concepts. Uh, but then conclude that surprisingly, ad hoc concepts turn out not to be concepts at all. So uh, that's very different from saying that that uh, uh, all concepts are ad hoc concepts. Uh, how do we how do we make sense of this? Well. Uh, I, I think it makes sense that that we need to think ad ad uh, ad hoc about how we construct the meaning of these utterances, right? Even if we were to use this standard concept of being a great guitarist, right? Uh, who who we who we fill in the blank with uh, is going to matter a lot, right? Uh, if we apply if we apply the same criterion of great guitarist uh, to to these two performers. Uh, we're 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 going to be hilariously wrong about the the kinds of attributes that 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 we uh, project onto them. So uh, finally, turning to word meanings, we did we did categories, we did concepts. Now let's now let's do word meanings to complete our CCNMs. Uh, again, Barcelou, a champion of of uh, uh, paying attention to contextual variability, uh, wrote in in this landmark paper that although there is contextual variability context independent properties form the core meanings of words well i think that uh the, the larry at the time said that these are the these core core properties are activated maximally and obligatorily whenever we use words now i think his thinking about this has changed um in in the past decades uh but if we want to to address this concern we need to think back to, to wittgenstein or look to examples like, like Herb Clark uh, introduced. Um, uh, Herb Clark uh, pointed out that people use language in ways that are off the map all the time. Uh, uh, he, he came up with some silly examples of the ad hoc or for the nonce use uh, of, of words, uh, for the nonce meaning only for the present purposes. Uh, in one example, uh, he has a fictitious friend uh, who has a perverse habit of sneaking up behind people and rubbing a teapot on the backs of their legs, uh, a habit that, that this person's friends call teapotting. Well, you may never have heard the word teapotting before this context, but once you know it, you have no problem understanding this otherwise nonsensical sentence like Herb's friend got in big trouble again uh, because he, he tried to teapot a policeman, right? Now, uh, uh, on a skeptical interpretation of this example, sure, the use of, of teapot here is definitely novel, uh, and it could not have just been retrieved from a mental lexicon. But semantically, the apple has not fallen very far from the tree. This example seems in line with Jeff Elman's idea that although words do not have a finite list of meanings or senses, uh, that uh, every meaning of a word inhabits what Elman calls a bounded region of state space that is inhabited only by other members of this lexeme, right? So, so there's variability, but there, there are strict constraints and, and bounded spaces of meaning. Well, if this were true, this is you know, the Her, Herb, Herb, and, uh, Herb Clark and Jeff Elman are, are two of my intellectual heroes, uh, but, but, I, but I think they're, they're really missing uh, the extent of the ubiquity of nonce sense. If this were true, if every meaning inhabits a bounded, uh, exclusive region of, of state space, then the link between words and meanings would be flexible, but also highly constrained. 
Uh, and uh, the, the example like teapotting could never be used to support a radical claim like I'm making, which is that given the right context, any word can mean anything. But I think this is true and that ordinary life provides lots of examples. Uh, one, one stuck in my head, I think, because it it uh, reminded me of, of Herb's teapotting example, but this is a uh, an example from, from uh, personal life, uh, autobiographical example. Um, uh, just just a trigger warning. There's some mild adult content coming, uh, so so plug your ears if if you you don't wish to to hear it. Uh, uh, this anecdote stuck with me um, uh, when I was a, a postdoc uh, living in an apartment complex full of young single people. Uh, there were always couples forming and breaking apart. It was like a, a real life telenovela. Uh, and one time, a new couple had just gotten together, and then they arrived at a dinner party. Uh, late and breathless and disheveled and red-faced. Uh, and the, the woman, the couple excused them saying, uh, uh, oh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry we're late. We were at my apartment having tea. Uh, and everyone laughed. Uh, and, and of course, everyone knew instantly what tea meant in this context. And someone said, oh, is that what they're calling it these days, right? And from the instantly, and then from that moment on, in this group of friends, we could use the word T, the lexium T, to mean sex. Now, how did we do it? How did we know instantly that T meant sex in this context? Well, here are some ways that we didn't do it. Here is the traditional view like, like Ray Jackendorf's, uh, according to which word meanings are stored in a lexicon. What is a lexicon? A lexicon is a catalog, a catalog of conventional form meaning pairings. Is T paired with sex in your lexicon? It is now in mine, it may be now in yours too, uh, but it wasn't prior to this instance, right? Well, maybe it's not a pairing. Maybe it's a prototype or a probability density. Uh, or as, as Jeff Elman would say, a region of, of semantic space uh, that constrains what T can and cannot mean, a bounded region of state space. Well, uh, maybe, but uh, whatever that region of concept space is that T inhabits, it had better be awfully big to include sex, right? A bounded region of semantic space that is big enough to include both T and sex would be so big that arguably it wouldn't do any inferential work at all. So uh, Herb Clark's point in 1983 and my point here is that instances like this are not exceptions to be bracketed while we develop theories of normal language use, of normal word meaning. This is normal language use. Ad hoc meaning construction is the rule, not the exception. So if that's true, then why don't we see it? Why is it so hard to intuit that all conceptualizing is ad hoc? Well, I think there are lots of reasons for this. Many things work toward uh, the impression of stability, the, the, the misimpression of stability. Uh, and one uh, we've, we've called the, the, the words for concepts illusion. So uh, word forms are the same or, or basically the same time after time after time with the printed word. A word form can be exactly identical time after time. It's natural. If we, if we believe that word forms label concepts, it's natural to assume that if a verbal label is the same time after time, that the concept being labeled is also the same time after time. But that assumption is almost guaranteed to be wrong, right? Why don't we see that it's wrong? Well, another, another factor that uh, contributes sort of an unhelpful uh, illusion of stability, uh, we've called conceptual change blindness, right? So, it's very hard. Most of our thinking is is you know below the surface, right? We 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 rarely introspect on our processes of thinking as we're just going along throughout our day, seeing things and categorizing them and understanding language. And if we even if we try, we're not very good at it. We don't we we don't have much insight into the the, the unconscious workings of our mind. And uh, it's natural to assume that if we understand the word dog at time one. Uh, and then uh, understand the same word at dog two, uh, that it's the same dog, right? That it's the same word form, we're activating the same concept corresponding to that word form, but that is almost vanishingly unlikely to be true, right? If 
if the the if, if the the constellation of information that's getting activated in response to the 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 word form dog um uh is is dependent on the context and the context is always changing then that constellation of information is always changing too so uh uh that is uh an, a, a, w one of the factors another factor um that that i've pointed to a, what i call the reification assumption right this this goes back to uh, an ancient uh, philosophical puzzle uh, uh, about the the ontology of of fire, uh, and it was long believed that there is some stuff called phlogiston that is the stuff that supports fire, right? And this leads to a, a real problem, right? So so uh, what is the nature of fire? Well, fire is is the result of of the of uh, the the consumption of phlogiston. Well, that makes you ask the question, what is this stuff? What is phlogiston? Um, how does it give rise to fire, right? What's the process? And um, we can't ever answer those questions, right? Why can't we answer these questions about the nature uh, and, and operation of phlogiston? Because it doesn't exist, right? There is no stuff. Burning is a process. It involves uh, the, 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 the things being burned and heat. Uh, and there is no substrate like phlogiston, uh, uh, and and, and uh, positing that there is such a substrate can only put us on the wrong path in terms of explanation. Uh, so uh, the 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 analog of phlogiston in cognitive science is concepts, right? Phlogiston is the 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 stuff that supports fire. Concepts are the stuff that supports thought, right? Well, what are these things concepts? How do they give rise to thoughts? Maybe, maybe there are no things in the sense that 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 we have we believed. Instead, conceptualizing is a process of activating uh, information in in memory or in perception in response to endogenous and exogenous cues in context. So I'll mention one more. Um, so how could it be that th these are th these assumptions are operating on short time scales? I mentioned that our CCNMs vary on various time scales, right? Uh, as they're being instantiated, or from one instantiation to the next, but also from from person to person and group to group uh, on longer time scales. And uh, how could that be? Well, um, here's a here's a very very simple model of uh, how, how cognition works, right? And how experience gives rise to beliefs and behaviors, right? We don't know how this happens, right? This is, this is the mystery of, of cognition, right? The, the behaviorist model uh, went from experience to behaviors. And then uh, about 70 years ago, we started saying, yeah, but what's the function that transforms experience into behaviors? or if we want to uh, back off slightly to, to say into behaviors or thoughts or patterns of brain activity. And experience in, in some ways, we, we all live in the same physical world. We have fairly similar bodies to each other, right? We have fairly similar cultures to each other um, if, if, you, if you pull back the lens far enough, uh, but actually not exactly the same. This, this arrow of experience is actually a bunch of distinct arrows, right? So uh, an easy assumption here is that, sure, different groups, so, so this red line and this orange line and this yellow line, uh, that these are, these are three different varieties of experience, say three different cultures, uh, three different types of linguistic structure, right? Three, three, three different uh, varieties of, of human bodies. They're pretty similar to each other, right? And so when you, when you process these pretty similar experiences through this, let's let's assume it's universal through this universal uh, function that that is how uh, experience gets gets transformed into thoughts and behaviors. Uh, the the input is pretty similar, and so the output's going to be pretty similar. Well, that would be true. This model would 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 be likely to hold if this function were a linear function. But we don't know what that function is, but, but uh, I, I'm, I'm going to make an assertion, which is that whatever the function is that relates experience to thoughts and behaviors, uh, or whatever the sets of functions are, they are sure, surely nonlinear functions. 
what do we know about small differences as the input to nonlinear functions? Well, even to simple, even simple nonlinear functions exhibit a, a property uh, called uh, sensitive dependence on initial conditions, right? So what that means is that small differences in the input to a nonlinear function do not produce small differences in the output. They can produce radical differences in the output. So one, one very uh, simple toy example here, uh, uh, here's, here's a very simple nonlinear equation. Uh, this is a plot uh, of how a population of rabbits grows in a fictitious forest according, according to this equation. N is the initial uh, population of rabbits. Alpha is the average number of offspring per generation of rabbits, right? Well, if we uh, increase alpha by one rabbit per year, you can see that we increase the, the total number of, of the total population of rabbits, right? That makes total sense, right? But it's a uh, it, it's it's a very, very slight change. You go from alpha of two to alpha of three, and you boost the 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 function a tiny bit, right? What happens with even this very simple nonlinear function? Maybe maybe you know what's coming if you boost the alpha from from three to four. Well, what happens? is this, this uh, uh, by, by varying this one parameter a little bit, you get a hugely different uh, 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 output of, of this very simple nonlinear function. Imagine all of the functions that transform our myriad kinds of experiences into our myriad kinds of thoughts and behaviors and the kind of wild divergence that the nonlinearity of these functions would generate between individuals, between groups, between instances of thinking, right? Between instances of thinking, quote, the same thing twice. Uh, uh, surely our thinking exhibits sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So, okay, uh, following these assumptions, how might an ad hoc cognition framework change the way we think about thinking and language use? And I'll, I'll run through some of these examples uh, quickly, because I, I want to make sure that we have uh, plenty of time to discuss. There are lots of things uh, that uh, may be different, uh, may, may not be universal in our experience. Uh, but one thing that that we're we're pretty sure is universal, at least at a, at a, a given elevation, uh, if you fly off into space or to the top of a, a, a skyscraper, that you get some changes. But uh, to a first approximation. Time is universal and constant throughout our physical world and throughout throughout human experience. And that makes time pretty pretty cool, pretty special. It makes it unlike things that vary from a bit, be, between different people's experience as a, as a function of the, the particular sensory systems they have or where they live on the planet, right? Um, uh, there, there are debates, for example, about whether, speakers of different languages perceive colors differently. Well, one of the one of the difficulties in addressing that that question is that when you find uh, communities who speak very different color languages, they also live in different places on the planet and the light is different and the landscape is different. The colors they see may in fact be different, right? But time, unlike light and landscape and flora and fauna and people and artifacts that vary from place to place and group to group, time is, is, is universal and constant. So this is useful to us because if temporal cognition is changeable over time or, or, or across people, we know that it's not due to changes in time per se, right? And so studying the variability of temporal cognition allows us to isolate changes that are due to various aspects of the context. Now, as English speakers, how do we think about time? Well, uh, for, for over 100 years, uh, linguists and, and psychologists have, have uh, sought to answer this question by pointing to how we talk about time. So in English, there's a very, very clear, very standard way of talking about uh, uh, the past and the future. The future is ahead of us. The past is behind us. It's as if time flows along a, a timeline that goes through our bodies sagittally front to back uh, with, with uh, uh, events in the future ahead of us and events that, that have already occurred behind us. Why, why might that be? Well, uh, 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 linguists and psychologists posited a really compelling story, at least a, a story that I find very compelling, which is that we talk about time the way we do 
because we think about it that way. And we think about it that way because of the way we move through the physical world using the particular kinds of bodies that humans have. So humans have bodies that are asymmetric front to back, right? The, the front is the business side of our bodies. That's where our hands and feet and sensory organs are, are, are uh, oriented. Uh, our backsides are fairly different. Uh, and because of the, the nature of our human bodies, when we move through space, we tend to do so uh, sagittally, moving, moving uh, uh, frontward along spatial paths. As we do, we create a correlation between progress through space and progress through time. The things that we will come to in the future as we walk forward along a path lie literally ahead of us. The things we've already passed uh, lie literally behind us in space. So uh, 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 the, the, the story here is that we, we uh, talk and think about time as if it goes uh, flows along a sagittal axis because of the way we move along sagittal spatial paths uh, based on this universal aspect of our bodily interactions with the natural environment. Cool, cool story. One thing that supports this story uh, that, that uh, linguists have pointed to for many years is that uh, what English speakers will never say and what is not uh, attested widely in any known spoken language is a left-right mapping of time onto lateral space, right? We, we can't say things like, oh, that happened way left in the past, or that's going to happen far right in the future, right? Monday comes before Tuesday. It doesn't come to the left of Tuesday uh, in, our, in our linguistic metaphors for time. Uh, and uh, uh, it should be possible to see these patterns uh, of spatializing time not just in language, but in other kinds of, of behavior, like spontaneous gesture as we speak. And I, I actually did an experiment a number of years ago uh, expecting to see in people's spontaneous hand gestures as they talk about uh, 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 the different points in time, this sagittal front-back mapping of time uh, that is so clear from looking at linguistic metaphors in English and other languages. Um, so we brought students into the lab, we made them memorize little stories that, that where, where the narrative uh, extends farther and farther into the past or the future. Uh, and, and we thought we'll just be able to, to observe this sagittal front back mapping of time in their minds by watching how they spontaneously use their hands. So here's one example from, from this set of, of videos of spontaneous gestures during storytelling, this this guy is going to tell a scintillating story about the history of farming, it's, which is completely made up. Okay, so I remind you before that uh, farming methods are changed in the course of the 20th century. Um, so uh, the farming methods used by modern farmers are a lot different are than the farming methods used at the earlier in the century, which was much more primitive. Like today, they use diesel powered tractors to plow the fields. Whereas only like half a century ago, they were using horse-drawn plows. And then a generation before that, they had to do everything by hand. So I wonder how life was different than the people, uh, for the farmers at the beginning of the 20th century compared to modern farmers. Interesting. That's yeah, so, so interesting. They love the stories. Okay, so you see all of those clear front-back gestures. The future is ahead and the past is behind, right? No, not a single one. This guy is gesturing a lot. He's gesturing very systematically. He's got great big hands, uh, very very easy to see, but he's spatializing time on the lateral left-right axis. Earlier times are to the left. He At one point, it's beautiful. He says a century ago and then a century before that, uh, the, the times that are farther into the past are farther to the left. It's a, it's a beautiful continuum left, left to right. What's going on with that? Well, is it just this guy? Is this uh, cherry pick this one guy? Well, no, whoops. If you uh, take all of the videos in this set, and now we've replicated this in, in, in multiple experiments, uh, you can see this pattern where, where uh, speakers of English and other languages are gesturing leftward for earlier times and rightward for later times. If you make this same kind of graph for the sagittal axis, you see no such pattern, right? There's no interaction of direction in time and direction in space on the sagittal axis. So what's going on here? What, what, are, what are people's minds responding to? We, we have this beautiful story about uh, how walking through 
uh, walking along sagittal paths spatializes time sagittally. Well, now we live in a world where our interactions with the natural environment are not our only form of, of regular interaction with, with, uh, with the spatial world and may not be the most frequent. Here I, here I am, uh, sitting in a chair, not moving, but reading lots of text, right? Every, every slide has text all over it. I'm not reading it in, in depth in sagittal space. I'm reading it laterally. So we can tell the same kind of story about a correlation between space and time. The same, same kind of story that you tell about walking along the sagittal axis, you can tell about reading along the lateral axis. So this happens to be a calendar where we're expressly spatializing time, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? Unfolding from left to right. But actually you don't need to be reading about time. Any text that you read in, in Western cultures, you uh, provide evidence for this correlation between uh, time and space, where every, every line that you read, every pair of pages that you read, you start on the left at an earlier moment, you move gradually through space and time, ending up on the right at a later moment. So early left, later right, early left, later right. So maybe our our built world, right? This 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 aspect of uh, 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 Western culture of, of reading and writing that we engage in so frequently is uh, more salient to us that, than our experience of moving through the natural world and is conditioning how we think about time and is doing it uh, in advance of linguistic changes. We actually are starting to talk about uh, uh, language using a left-right axis. It just hasn't, hasn't really caught on yet. How do we know if reading experience is sufficient to cause this, this unexpected pattern of thinking about time? Well, we can bring people into the lab and we can give them what is now a very standard um, uh, button, bu button press reaction time task where you see phrases on the, on the screen like a year earlier or a day later. These are phrases expressing times in the past or the future. And your job is just to classify each phrase as this about the past or about the future. You hit one button for past and the other button for future. And for half of the experiment, the, the, the future button is on the right and the, the past button is on the left. For the other half of the experiment, you switch that button mapping. Now the, the, the future is on the left and the past is on the right. And you compare how many milliseconds it takes to, to correctly judge the meaning of these phrases as a function of these buttons being mapped earlier left, later right, or vice versa. What we see is a very now a, a very standard, very well validated uh, congruity effect, where you're faster to hit the left button uh, for phrases about the past, and faster to hit the right button for phrases about the future. That is, if you're given normal Western orthography. But what happens if you expose people to mirror reversed orthography? Well, in this case. Now, instead of having, instead of moving your eyes, your attention gradually from the left to the right, you are creating the opposite correlation between space and time. Each phrase, your eyes, or your attention start on the right at an earlier moment and and finish on the left at a later moment. So, so earlier, earlier right, later left, this mirror reversed writing, but to, to hit the left button for future oriented phrases and the right button for past oriented phrases, uh, even a few minutes of changing this uh, experienced correlation between space and time can completely reverse the flow of time in people's minds. So uh, uh, we were exploring this, this idea uh, of, of, of a few years ago in a culture that reads uh, backwards of, of Western culture in, in uh, Arabic reading cultures. And again, looking at uh, people's spontaneous gestures as an index of how they're thinking about time. And uh, we compared Spaniards with, with speakers of Moroccan Arabic. Uh, and as expected, this is the percent of gestures on the lateral axis. Um, people were, uh, Spaniards were, were systematically uh, gesturing leftward for earlier times and rightward for later times. Moroccans were doing exactly the opposite, gesturing uh, rightward for earlier times, leftward for later times. This was just confirmation of, of what we expected to see. Uh, I was I was happy to see this. Confirma confirmation is nice, right? Uh, uh, more naturalistic experiments are nice, uh, but I but I wasn't the least bit surprised by this. There was, however, a surprise in the data. 
uh, we we expected on the sagittal axis we would compare these these lateral gestures that were supposed to follow the Spanish or the Arabic reading and writing direction with sagittal gestures where we didn't really expect any difference between groups. The, the Spaniards were just like the, the English speakers from the from the set that I showed you a few minutes ago. Uh, this is 50%. This is this is you, you, you don't really care whether you're gesturing ahead or behind for for past and future. Uh, the, the, you're about equally likely to put the future in front of you or the or the past in front of you. But the Moroccans showed a very different pattern. They they seem to be showing a very strong spatialization of time on the on the sagittal front back axis. Um, this was a hugely significant result in in, in this initial analysis. Um, and at first we thought, well, why are they why are they gesturing according to the way they walk through the world? Why are they showing this future as a head pattern? But actually, they're not. If you look at the graph carefully, and I checked this about a hundred times, uh, they're showing a past in front pattern. They appear to be very systematically putting the past ahead of them. Well, this was totally unexpected. It doesn't matter if, if it's a strong pattern, if, if you have bizarre, unexpected data. Uh, the first thing you've got to do is, is um, you know, try, try to come up with an explanation for it. You don't just assume that you've learned something new. And there's no explanation for it in terms of the way uh, Arabic is written, right? Yes, Arabic is written uh, uh, right to left, but that can't explain this difference on the sagittal front back axis. Writing direction shouldn't matter. We can't explain it in terms of linguistic metaphors because they don't say things like Monday is to the left of Tuesday, right? Arabic uh, space-time metaphors are very much like English. They say things like the future is ahead of them and uh, the past is behind them. So it's not about writing. It's not about talking. Uh, what what else? Well, we we mentioned this influence of moving through the natural environment. We we know very well that that Arabic speakers have hands and feet and bodies much like ours, right? They they don't uh, they don't walk backwards typically, right? So it's not about uh, the way they walk or the way they talk or the way they write. Uh, so let's let's first just find out if there's anything going on here. So the, our, our our first step was to replicate these findings with a complementary method. And we had a method available, it's a very silly method, where we give people this diagram, and we tell them that this character who is Bob in English, or he's Juan or Mohammed, uh, depending on the, the language you're speaking, uh, is, is uh, going to visit a friend who likes animals tomorrow. Yesterday, he visited a friend who likes plants. Your job is to indicate which of these boxes best represents uh, things uh, that will happen tomorrow, like seeing the plant, plant uh, the animal lover, or things that happened yesterday, like seeing the plant lover. Across uh, subjects, you counterbalance uh, which of these questions comes first, uh, and the results in Spaniards were were just what we expected. The, this diagram shows where do they put the past? Well, of course they put the past behind Juan's head, right? The past is behind, but the Moroccans, about eighty five percent of the time, put the past in front of them. So this seems to be real. What's going on here? If it's not about language, it's not about writing, it's not about locomotion, maybe it's something about their culture. So imagine if you, uh, if, 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 if you are in a, in a culture where you and almost everyone you know prostrate yourselves five times a day to say these ancient prayers, right? where millions of men are named after the same ancient prophet. It's the, the most common men's name, right? This is a culture with a very strong appreciation for the past, a very strong orientation toward the past. Maybe Moroccans put the past in front of them, or at least tend to put the past in front of them, because the past is what they tend to focus on. Uh, now, this sounds sort of like a, a, a parody of metaphor theory, right? Uh, but, but, but bear with me. So uh, we call this the temporal focus hypothesis. People con conceptualize events in time as if they were objects in space. Some people, some, some individuals in some cultures, tend to focus their attention more on either the past or on the future. Maybe people place in front of them in their mental model whichever pole of the time continuum they tend to focus on. Right, uh, and so if you are a past-focused person, you're going to put the past in front of you in your mental model of time. How do we find out? Well, we need to first 
validate this this intuition that that was um, that, that that was shared by uh, uh, other uh, uh, anthropologist colleagues that indeed Morocco is a is a much more past focused culture than than most European cultures. So we made up a little questionnaire. Uh, how strongly do you agree with statements like customs are very important to me, or technological advances are good for society, either past oriented or future oriented statements? And uh, as expected. Compared to the Spaniards, the Moroccans were were much more strongly in agreement with these past focused statements, right? They're a more past focused culture. So potentially, this greater past focus could account for their putting the past in front of them. If that's true, if temporal focus, where where you tend to focus your your attention on the past or the future, is responsible for why these these Moroccans are spatializing time in a, in a way we never expected, we should be able to observe the operation of temporal focus, not just across cultures, like between Spain and Morocco, but within cultures, between people who have, on average, different temporal focus. Well, how do you find groups within a culture with different temporal focus? It's, it's actually very easy. Younger people, we know from previous work, tend to be more future focused. Older people tend to be more past focused. Right, so we we can go to a school and a nursing home and give people this silly time diagram task and ask uh, whether young people uh, are more likely to put the future in front of them. Indeed, they are. These are young Spaniards. Older Spaniards are much more likely to put the past in front of them, even though these are these are monolingual Spaniards. Uh, just it, it's not as strong as the the pattern we saw in Moroccans, but just being old gets you about halfway to Morocco. Uh, so uh, we've replicated this in, in new groups of, of young and old Spaniards and, and correlated it with their their responses on a on the temporal focus questionnaire. But we still don't have evidence for a causal role of temporal focus, right? What we're just showing correlation between uh, how you think about time and how you spatialize it uh, uh, across cultures and, and and across age groups. If we want to know that temporal focus, where you focus your attention on the past or the on uh, on the past or on the future is playing a causal role in how people spatialize time in their minds then we need a different kind of experiment right we need a a a, uh, a randomized uh, a, a, a randomized controlled trial right where we uh, cause people to either think about the past or think about the future. Well, it's actually very easy to do that. We give them a little writing exercise. We ask them uh, pairs, uh, one, of, one of these sets of questions, like, did you travel anywhere last year? Where'd you go? Or are you planning to travel anywhere next year? Where will you go, right? And after a few minutes of focusing their attention on their past or their future, we give them the time diagram task. And after, being induced to think about their future, people, th these young Spaniards were very, very likely to place the, the future in front of them. After being induced to think about their past for a few minutes, they were much more likely to put the past in front of them, like old people or Moroccans. So it, it appears that uh, changing people's temporal focus can change the way that we uh, 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 orient time in our, in our minds, on our mental timelines. This uh, for, the, the fun thing about having a really silly, simple uh, uh, measure like this, this uh, time diagram task is that you can run it uh, very easily all over the world. And we and other colleagues have done so. Uh, there, th this task has now been run in uh, 47 cultures and subcultures uh, across five continents. Uh, and uh, each of these dots is... Uh, a, a sample. Uh, this is this is I forget how many thousands of, of subjects this is, uh, but it's it's dozens of, of populations. Uh, on this axis, this is the their temporal focus index. To the left of of this zero point, they are a past focused culture. To the right, they're a future focused culture. Uh, above this this zero point, uh, sorry, above above this fifty percent point, you are likely. Whoops, uh, you are likely to put. Uh, the future ahead, below it, you're likely to put the past ahead. So all of these people, so this whole quadrant, these are people who are past focused and put the past in front of them in their mental model of time, in spite of the way they walk and in spite of the way they talk. All of these groups use linguistic, all of these groups, so far as we know, walk forward through space, and all of them use linguistic metaphors that put the future ahead. But everyone in this quadrant 
uh, puts the past ahead in their mental model of time uh, because of their temporal focus. Uh, these are the, so there have been some really creative uh, uh, tests of this idea done by some of our colleagues. Uh, one, one of these dots is Chinese people on uh, Chinese New Year Day versus Tomb Sweeping Day, where you think about your ancestors. Uh, these are people coming out of uh, history and architecture museums versus uh, 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 modern art museums, right, where you're, where you're focusing on, on earlier or later times. This is one of these dots is pregnant versus non-pregnant women, right? Pregnant women are expecting, they're, they're looking toward this, this blessed future event. Uh, and so uh, your temporal focus can change on all of these different timescales. Uh, and so can uh, your mental model of time uh, change accordingly. So let me wrap up here. Uh, time in context, if the slide will go forward. Uh, time in the world is the same for everyone. Time in the mind depends radically on our experiential context, right? On our culture, on our life stage, on our immediate experience. Thinking about back in time may not actually mean back. Depending upon your context, it may actually mean left or right or forward. Five minutes of reading backward or of shifting our usual focus of attention can reverse the flow of time in our minds, either on the lateral axis or on the sagittal axis. Uh, the, the timeline that we ordinarily use can be completely flipped uh, in either of these axes. And this is in spite of a lifetime of experience with the future being ahead in our walking and in, in our in our talking, uh, transient experience can overwhelm these lifelong patterns. So uh, to wrap up, the the mind is being constructed continually on the basis of our interactions with the physical and the social context. When context changes, our thinking may change accordingly. And what that what that suggests to me is that the stability of our mind is in part an illusion, right? And one of the reasons that it appears stable to us is because we're bad at noticing changes, right? Uh, but also the stability of the, the mind is in part emergent. Where the context is stable, our thinking that depends on that context will be stable as well. However, that stability is not inherent in the mind. The, the stability that we enjoy may be borrowed from stable aspects of the context. We know that because when the context is stable, our thoughts are stable. But when the context changes, we've seen uh, lots of examples just, just in, in the past uh, hour of how our mind can change accordingly. So do we need to uh, uh, change the way that, that we think about concepts for, for all contexts. Well, uh, going again to, to Ray Jackendoff, uh, asking a psychologist or a philosopher or a linguist what a concept is, is much like asking a physicist what mass is. An answer cannot be given in, in isolation. And I think that, that uh, uh, I very much agree to build on Ray's suggestion I assume that no physicist believes that Newtonian mechanics is an adequate description of the physical world. New Newtonian mechanics is wrong, and we think that relativistic physics is a lot less wrong, but we still re rely on classical mechanics to solve a lot of practical problems. If you want to know whether you should go on a diet, right, you use a, Newton a Newtonian conception of mass. However, if you want to understand the workings of the universe to the best of our abilities, you're going to use a relativistic theory of mass, which happily for our present discussion is a theory of mass in context. Likewise, there are situations where invoking stable concepts and core meanings of words is going to serve us well. If your kid asks you, what does the word aviary mean? You're, you're, you're not gonna respond, well, that's an ill-posed question. The meaning of a word is always constructed ad hoc, right? Uh, that's not gonna help your kid very much. I'm not denying that people learn the conventional denotations of words. We do, and we should tell our kids about them. Uh, I'm just saying that we can't confuse those conventional denotations with what words actually mean when people use them. Rather, the fact that words have conventional denotations helps to make them powerful cues that guide the ad hoc construction of meaning. So as normal people, we can accept that words have meanings. 
As cognitive scientists who want to understand the workings of the human mind to the best of our abilities, we need to proceed from the assumption that all concepts and categories and word meanings are constructed ad hoc uh, and build theories of meaning and context. I'll stop there. Thank you very much.